Uh, good afternoon, um, and thank you very much for this, to, for coming to this first session uh, of the main congress. Um, our, our first, our opening plenary is on a topic that I'm sure you'll agree is incredibly important, particularly after the difficulties that we've all had over the last three years, but, but even in normal times, uh, which is how we care uh, for our caregivers. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my um, co-moderators, Lean, uh, Verkamst, and Joanne Fowles, um, and e even greater pleasure to introduce uh, Sonia Bulchinska, uh, a nurse who comes to us from the Prague in the Czech Republic. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sonia Vulchinska. I am an ICU nurse in General University Hospital in Prague. And the topic I will be talking about is called how to prevent burnout. Although it doesn't sound so cheerful, I hope it won't be too depressing for you. Many of you are familiar with the term burnout, but how can we define it? The simplest definition, in my opinion, is that burnout syndrome equals change of behavior. It is definitely not a new phenomenon. It has been identified and known for the past 60 years and become a popular way of describing what people have been experiencing in their work, especially during COVID-19 pandemic as healthcare workers. So what it means exactly? There are many different descriptions and definitions regarding burnout. State of physical and emotional exhaustion, when you've been experiencing long-term stress or you have worked in a physically or emotionally draining role for a long period of time, feeling drained most of the time, defeated, alone in the world, having cynical negative outlook, procrastinating, and overwhelmed. Unfortunately, burnout is also often misunderstood and stigmatized, and costly both to employees' health and well-being and employers' productivity. It influences both caregiver health in and out of work. It threatens patient care. It reduces safety decreases efficiency, but also has become a popular umbrella term for whatever distresses people in their work, but that cannot be defined as burnout syndrome. Regarding the work of nurses and all healthcare personnel, it can be defined or seen as a change of behavior resulting in cynicism, exhaustion, not being able to cope with standard tasks and eventually affecting standards of care. And sometimes burnout is con confused or mistaken with stress or anxiety. The main difference between those three is that stress is the general experience of physical, mental, and emotional factors that causes the person and nervous system to feel overwhelmed. Anxiety, besides being more of an internal response, differs from stress in its intensity and duration, being manifested by elevated heart rate, nausea, shortness of breath, or shaking. Whereas burnout is not a condition that happens suddenly, it evolves over time. A wide range of physical behavior changes begins, such as worse sleep patterns up to insomnia and headaches, and typical phrases such as I'm in a survival mode, I'm exhausted, or I'm done, often indicate that the person is experiencing burnout. So what are the burnout syndrome stages? The first enthusiasm phase is where we invest too much energy, resulting in overload with excessive drive or ambition while pushing yourself to work harder, neglecting personal care and needs, we make no time for non-work-related needs. And then comes the dullness, where we become aware of the reality, find out our expectations were not met, and we are sobering up. The third stage is manifested by frustration, where doubts and feelings of loneliness come along and we start to feel withdrawal. 
This is followed by apathy and exhaustion called as the autopilot mode, with no motivation for work turning eventually into isolation, and that's where behavior changes start, such as depersonalization and inner emptiness. The last stage is a fully developed burnout syndrome, resulting in loathing to communicate with no energy left to do anything, followed by depression, mental or physical exhaustion, or collapse. Obviously, it is important to measure burnout accurately and make proper diagnostics with consideration to ethics, awareness, and coping mechanisms. Among others, there are specifically structured questionnaires and standardized questionnaires, such as Maslach Burnout Inventory, Resilience Scale for Adults, and Insomnia Severity Index. Regarding MBI, it is a scientifically developed measure of burnout used wi uh, wide all over the world in research studies and is characterized by three dimensions. Feelings of exhaustion defined as emotional exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism related to one's job defined as depersonalization, and reduced professional efficacy defined as personal accomplishments. So who is likely to suffer the most? Women, not only because we are more emotional, but in general, there are more women working in healthcare than men, then obviously those who cannot maintain their work-life balance, those who need to prove something to others with expectations of appreciation and admiration, and obviously all of us sitting here as healthcare workers. I have looked at three surveys from other European countries, Italy, UK, and Spain, and the results were pretty much the same in all of them, regardless of past COVID times, which increased the workload of all healthcare personnel, therefore the risk and symptoms were much higher. Over half of the people questioned met the criteria for burnout. 45% reported symptoms of depression, with altogether statement that a third of intensive care unit staff are at high risk of burnout. Now, I would like to make a little introduction to the place I work at. Uh, in General University Hospital Prague, there are two clinics that work with ECMO. The first one is Department of Anesthesiology, Resuscitation and Intensive Care Medicine, with 98 nurses working in total. Maximum capacity of the departments being 20 beds. There are usually 17 nurses working per shift and we work 12 hour shifts. Approximately 60 ECMO per year are provided there, mainly to patients with respiratory failure, but also with cardiac failure. The second department or clinic dealing with ECMO in General University Hospital is Department of Second Internal Medicine, with 26 nurses working in total. Maximum capacity of the department is seven beds. There are usually six to seven nurses working per shift, and they also work 12-hour shifts. Approximately 20 ECMO per year are provided there, mainly to patients with cardiac failure. Using specifically structured questionnaire, an MBI questionnaire, I have conducted a little survey on my own in both of those clinics, and the results were pretty surprising for me. Regarding the first clinic, I have questioned 48 nurses out of 98. Over three quarters of them do not feel emotional exhaustion, neither, neither depersonalization. And almost 74% feel they have achieved some sort of personal accomplishments. Also, only half feel supported and appreciated in their current workplace, but 77% don't feel overloaded with work. Regarding the second clinic, I have questioned 15 nurses out of 26, where almost three quarters of them do not feel any emotional exhaustion and feel they have achieved some sort of 
personal accomplishments, and nearly all of them do not feel any depersonalization. But unlike in the first clinic here, over 80% of the questioned nurses feel supported and appreciated in their current workplace. But in comparison to the other department, only 60% do not feel overloaded with work. In both clinics, most of the nurses questioned agree that burnout syndrome is mainly connected to happiness in personal issues and life. Over three quarters have experienced some symptoms of burnout. So if you look at the data from the other end, almost quarter of nurses stated some level of depersonalization and feel emotionally exhausted. And over a quarter of them do not feel achieving many personal accomplishments in their work. Although General University Hospital provides support regarding burnout syndrome free of charge for its staff, and these nurses are aware of it, they would not reach for it in case needed because they don't find it trustworthy. And they would look for help somewhere else, mainly amongst those closest to them. But all of these nurses agree that the most important thing is that people and work team plus type of work plus money and communication with supervisors equals good and friendly working place in which they would be willing to work for a longer period of time. Unrealistic expectations, stressful work, personal issues and stability are one of the factors contributing to the development of burnout syndrome. So how to deal with burnout? There are several ways of getting support in case you need it, websites, applications, psychological or psychiatric therapy, colleagues, family, friends, and of course, each of us would prefer different options suitable for them. Therefore, I would like to point out three important points to prevent burnout as a guide and to uh, prevent the development of burnout itself. Recognize, which means watch for the warning signs of burnout within yourself and your colleagues as well. Reverse means undo the damage by seeking support and managing stress and build your resilience to stress by taking care of your physical and emotional health. Employees and managers need to address burnout seriously, spot the signs and know when you are working too much. Have you spotted someone being too emotional, stressed out or exhausted? Turn to other people, be more sociable, find some value in your work, find balance and take time off, set boundaries and practice good sleep habits. So most importantly, take care of yourselves and do what makes you happy. Last but not least, I would like to take this opportunity to promote the contributions of Associated Professor Martin Barik and Professor Jan Bielohlavek, without whom there would be no ECMO Center in General University Hospital, and I would not have had the opportunity to be presenting to you all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sonia. That was a really, really interesting talk. I think what we'll do is we'll um, regroup at the end and ask questions at the end and have, maybe have a discussion with all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is um, Gemma, unfortunately, can't be with us. So um, First Reserve has come into action. Uh, and this is Henrik Book, and he's a head nurse from um, Karolinska in Stockholm. Thank you, uh, and thank you uh, for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the subject of doing the same with less, managing the ECMO nursing team. Uh, my name is Henrik Bucht, and I'm working as a nursing manager at the ECMO Center at Karolinska. 
I have no disclosure uh, conflicts of interest. Importance of an efficient ECMO nursing team. ECMO is a complex therapy that requires specialized knowledge and skills. ECMO nurses play a critical role in managing the ECMO equipment and monitoring the patient's condition during the ECMO therapy. There must be knowledgeable about the medication and contraindication of ECMO as well as the potential complication and side effects. In our center, Stockholm, uh, the setup is that we have one medical director, uh, dedicated ECMO physicians, and we have two nurse managers. Unfortunately, again, I couldn't be here today, so I'm the second choice here. Dedicated cannulating surgeons that are part-time employed by the ECMO center. We have the ECMO coordinator, med tech coordinator, ECMO nurse specialist, assistant nurses, and then we have the mobile ECMO team uh, that consists of, a, consist of one ECMO physician, one surgeon, one ECMO nurse specialist, and one OR nurse. The staffing model of the ECMO center in Stockholm. Uh, the ECMO physician and the ECMO nurse roles are more or less integrated. We have one senior ECMO nurse to one patient. We have assistant nurses to two patients. And we have the ECMO physicians within the ward 24 seven and the mobile ECMO team on call 30 minutes from the center. We work in an open, open ward where it's easy to, to contact colleagues for help. We have, we have the ability to have six physical places uh, for ECMO patients that can expand to both eight and 12 during time of crisis. Uh, we plan that so we always have at least one ECMO nurse specialist during a shift. Uh, the nurse manager's office is located inside the wards and it's easy for us to be involved in what's going on on the ward because we're always in the middle of what's happening. We have different levels of nurses since we don't use perfusionists. We have the new uh, nurse coming to our ward and to be employed at the ECMO Center in Karolinska, you need to be an experienced ICU nurse. With uh, the first three months, uh, they, will, they will be with an experienced ECMO nurse specialist before caring for the patient on their own. Within the first year, the new nurse needs to participate in the ECMO course. Uh, it's about eight hours for all new staff. It's also, and what, what I mean with the old staff, it's not just the nurses, it's the assistant nurses, the intensivists, the surgeon. And it covers, covers the theoretical principle for the ECMO therapy practical and technical review of the ECMO pump and system. And that will give them the basic knowledge of the ECMO physiology. And after that course, there is a written examination. Then to become the senior ECMO nurse, you need to have been working at the ECMO center for at least two years. It will give you a bump in your pay grade. And you will have the ability to, to attend the advanced ECMO course. What, we, what, we, what you should be able to do when you are a senior ECMO nurse is uh, prime the ECMO system with sodium chloride, do the plasmapheresis, dialysis, prime the oxygenator, and, and initiate the weaning process. And then to become the ECMO nurse specialist, then you need to have worked full time for at least five years. Uh, and you get an additional bump in your pay grade. And you will be able to be participate in ECMO transport, uh, both within the hospital and also uh, national and international transport. You should be able to change the ECMO system, for example, from the transport system to the stationary, and to, you should be able to hold lectures and to be a speaker at conferences such as this. The challenge is in managing an ECMO nursing team. It's a high stress environment and the risk of burnout as we heard from the previous speaker. Managing the workload and shift, and shift schedules, ensuring staff competency and continuing education, and dealing with families in crisis situation, difficult treatment withdrawals, especially with children. And the strategies for an efficient, effective management, it's creating a positive work culture and promoting teamwork 
providing opportunities for professional development and continuing education, regular communication and feedback within, within the nursing team. And creating a positive work culture. We do that by encouraging an open communication and collaboration between the nurses and the, and the nurses' assistant and also the physicians. Providing emotional support and resources for staff. We use guided reflection. We also have micro-reflection uh, in the end of every shift. We're also trying to give some extra to, uh, to, our, to our staff uh, to create this positive work, work culture. So this year we have the opportunity to send um, staff to study visit to other centers in Europe. We have been in Barcelona and in London, and we're going to Paris, if, I, if I'm right. And also, we also send staff to participate in the ELSA conference. Professional development and continuing education of the staff. We're offering ongoing training and education opportunities. We do wet lab training every fifth week. That is mandatory. We also have a whole simulation for, for the nurses every semester, and also the nurses assistants. We're encouraging staff to pursue a certification in higher education and keep, keeping up to date the latest ECMO research and best practices. For the wet lab, we have different levels, of course. We have the basic level, what you do the first two years, and then you have the advanced. As I said, it's mandatory, and we do it every fifth week. Implementing evidence-based best practices, developing standardized protocols and guidelines, utilizing checklists and other tools to improve patient safety and outcomes, regularly reviewing and updating practices based on the latest research. Our ECMO nurses have, has their own area of expertise. It's get, we give them time to dig deeper into that subject. For example, we have hygiene, education, documentation, ethics, and so on and so forth. And we give them time so they can hold lecture for the rest of the staff and hopefully become better in that area. We hold regular communication and feedback. We hold a regular staff meeting and reflection. We are encouraging open and honest feedback from staff. And we're using a tool called PUL. Uh, it's a tool that was actually developed for the Swedish Armed Forces, and it gives you something called combat value. We started using this during the pandemic. And it is, you can get the feel for the pulse in the ward, and we do this every week, and we, get, we as managers get, get those results and we can act on it immediately. We're also providing regular performance evaluation feedback uh, that we talk to the nurses individual, individually, and we're looking back to the previous year, make a summary, and looking forward, setting up goals where we want to be for the next year. Conclusion, the importance of the effective ECMO nursing team management in providing high quality patient care and in providing outcomes. In summary, an effective ECMO nursing team is essential for providing safe and effective ECMO therapy and improving patient outcomes and providing emotional support to patients and families. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrik. Um, questions we will keep for the end, if it's okay for you. Perfect. Uh, so now I would like to Thank invite um, Natalia. Natalia, she is a crisis manager in the Karolinska Hospital in Sweden. So I look forward to your story. So, hi there. I don't see you. I usually used to have the audience so I can see you really close to me. Yay, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm really honored to be here, to be invited to share my passion, the well-being. And I'm really honored and happy to see that Joanne spoke earlier about care for caregivers, not only the patients. So what does that mean? Well, we have 30 minutes to dig into it. So let's see if we can start. 
And yeah, maybe I should share uh, my background. I'm a behavioral scientist, and uh, I started to work with Karolinska during the pandemic when I was coordinating the crisis assets uh, at Karolinska, all over the hospital where it was needed. And then I also came in contact with ECMO and have been working with them ever since. So um, I have also worked with uh, special units within military and police and uh, all different kind of sorts of company during the years. So let's see. I would like to start with the check-in because as I said, I usually have an interaction going on with those who are listening. And I will share the purpose why we do this and the reason further on. So we have a green light here. The green light is a symbol of where you have the state of feeling relaxed in a good place and everything's calm inside of you. And I must share, I'm not really calm in this moment. I have a bit of a vibration, as you can notice, I guess. And then we have the yellow, the yellow balloons. Um, they are about something is ongoing, something is cooking. You have some kind of tension, and yes, that's me in this moment. A bit of tension inside, where you feel a bit stress, could be good or bad stress, because all stress is a negative, as we all know. And uh, so some kind of higher level ongoing inside of you. And then the red one is where you really feel stressed out, that you really are in an intense uh, emotional state right now. So I would like you to help me with this. Because Jonathan, he wasn't sure if this was going to work out because you're so many of you. But I said, I really do want to try this anyway. So please help me. So I would ask you to choose a color, green, yellow, or red, for how your state is in this moment in your work life, and on the other hand, in your private life. So what's your color right now? Are you green, relaxed, nice, easy, calm, yellow, some kind of tension, red, and then we have a really tension and stress. So, I would like to hear from you what your work state is. So everyone who's green, please raise a hand. Okay, and take a look around, because this is your team. These all are your team. Thank you. And then we have the yellow ones. Who are yellow? Okay, take a look around. And red ones. And that is crucial to, ah, you're brave. You're brave to actually share that you are red, because usually it's like, oh, I don't know if I really want to share this. So thank you for being honest. And then we have in private life. So. Who's green? Woohoo! And the yellow ones? Yeah, some there as well. As we said, it might be good, might be bad. The yellow one is tricky. And the red one? Oh, okay, we have some run there. So we have to take care of the red ones really much this coming days, okay? Could you support me with that? So, thank you, and I will get back to why we did this later on, but keep on moving on here. So, the burning platform, what's actually cooking? Well, over 23 million European are working within uh, healthcare. And workers, as we heard before, uh, in the healthcare sector experience burnout more frequently than workers in other professions. Studies made by Swedish Koi uh, shows that every fifth young physician has fatigue symptoms since the pandemic. And several studies show that nurses experience moral distress. 
So isn't it time for you as caregivers to care for you? What do you say? Thank you. I appreciate that because <laughs> there are so much potential. There is so much possibility the more we are aware of our own capacity and what we actually can do. And if we have judges sitting on our shoulders telling us this and that. So to support me to give you a picture of what we have actually done at the ECMO in Stockholm, I have invited Lars and Henrik to join me here for a quick one to share some kind of answers for what we have been doing. So, an applaud, please. Welcome the map. So, nice having you here. Nice yeah. So, um, the first question is, what was the status in the group before we started working with the mental health? What do you say? So when uh, the pandemic broke up, uh, everything was turned up and down. I think you all know this. Um, and what we did was actually to work, start working with the Maslow's uh, uh, hierarchy of needs. First of all, you have the phys physiological needs. We could easily comfort the, the staff with that. And then you have the, the needs uh, of safety. So we implemented the, the safety protection for caring for these COVID patients. And thirdly, the third step is actually love and emotions, belonging. And that's a bit more tricky. <laughs> so we brought you in. Um, what we found out also was that we had a, a lack of a leadership. So we actually had to actually uh, turn the leadership upside down uh, at the first level of uh, of, um, in the first level hierarchy. Um, and there is where Henrik came in. Yeah, so what do you say, Henrik? I think you need to take a step ahead, front, because of the lights. Light. The lights. Lars, you as well, you had to be in the line. So. No, so, so when I took over, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the, the group was a little bit shaky, yeah. but it was starting to stabilize, uh, and, uh, but we could feel that it, it didn't take so much ruckus bef before it starts falling apart. Uh, and, and we worked with this throughout the years uh, with the help of you and then the help of, of the management and to become more stable uh, throughout the time now. Yeah, and how was the communication at the, at the, in the group? I mean, the communication uh, when I came in, it was overall, it was, uh, we had a few bad apples that could sometimes pop out and, and it could be some kind of hard uh, communication between uh, the staff, but we have slowly and steadily uh, worked around that. So I think we have a very good environment right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what changes have you personally experienced through working more with self-awareness, stress resilience and uh, coaching? But I think it's a journey that, you, that you're making both for yourself and, and for the whole group. Uh, and, and in the beginning, you, you don't really see the progress. But if you take a step back and look, and look uh, towards it, and you see that we have made giant leaps, actually. Yeah. But when you're in the middle of it, you can't really see it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Super. So what have we done then? Let's take a check on uh, what we have been looking into. So what is efficiency within healthcare? Yeah, so what we try to sort of sort out, what do we actually aim for within healthcare? I mean, we aim to have a, a good care for the patient, good quality of care, uh, but we need to balance that too with our resources. Uh, so when we come to quality, uh, you have the av availability. How many? How much uh, am I able to provide to my patients? Do we meet the needs of the patients out there? And then you have innovation, uh, development, and then the interaction with the patient and the, the, and the families of the patients. And then, of course, outcome, uh, morbidity and mortality. 
And then we balance these two with the resources that we have, the number of available beds. Uh, when I talk about available beds, I mean everything you, that you need to actually serve one bed. That could be ECMO machine, a, a ventilator, and so on. And then you have the costs. You need to actually have some sort of balance to your cost as well, because you can't cost to whatever you want. You need to balance that. And then you have the staff turnover. And the staff turnover, uh, you, since ECMO is a very specialized field, you really like to have your staff staying on as long as you can. You don't want to have them going to the next employee in just two years or something. You want to have them for the rest of life, hopefully. And everything, if we have this in balance, you will meet your resilience. You will have a unit that will be long lasting for hopefully work for several years. So what we did was actually, uh, <coughs> you had two, two pyramids. One is flipped upside down. So the pyramid on your left, that's sort of the more command hierarchy. You have the medical director and he commands. Uh, the second line manager to do whatever, who commands the next line, who commands the co-workers. Uh, what we did was that we flipped this upside down. Uh, and this, is, this could be a bit annoying for some people, but what it means is that every layer is supporting the layer above it. So that means that the, the medical director supports the second line, who supports the first line, who supports the co-workers. And by doing this, you will actually reach the patient will be in the center because the co-worker is the one who is caring for the patient. And the value of every co-worker is more like expressed in this way? And so the conditions then to reach this, what we call gold mission uh, directed organization is, uh, I understand as an individual, my uh, part of the organization, uh, I have a personalized leadership where uh, Natalia came in to help us. Um, the leadership of the, the, not only the leaders like me and Henrik, but also among the physicians. Because this is something that we also realized that the, the physicians actually weren't always functioning leaders, but they are always leaders within these teams. So uh, we also built in uh, workshops where the physicians needed to sort of uh, for find their leadership. Then we work with goals, very clear goals, frameworks and structures, and uh, trust. Uh, and that is to have a trust not only uh, among the employees, but also to your organization and yourself. And then open communication, and something that we say dare to try and retry, that is we, we may not, not always know if what we do will work, uh, but we do it anyway but then we must have the ability to back out of it if we, are, if we see that it doesn't actually do, if it come to the effect that we need. Super, thank you. So let's dig into a bit deeper what to do, how to care for caregivers. Thank you. So thank you to Lars and Henrik. So what did we do? How did we start? Um, for one thing, we worked as with the crisis at, during the pandemic, as we um, shared. But we use this model, and there are several different kind of models, but this is the one that I use, where we have commitment in the bottom, committing to my profession, committing to where I am working at, and the commitment towards myself also, I would say. But we will get into that also soon. Um, I have had several talks with your colleagues, mostly with different kind of colleagues during the pandemic. And during the exhaustion and feeling lack of energy, the commitment was always there. It was really beautiful to see, and for me, sorry, <laughs> to be quite new in, within the healthcare at that time, um, really touched me. So that's also one of the reasons why I'm really glad to stand here today and share more about how you can care for yourself in, even more. So we have the relations in the bottom 
and the relations is how can we bridge the interpersonal relationship with each other. And the relationship with myself. So why, what, how? They usually are known with what the task is, the mission, you usually know and have a really clear checklist and everything. But the relationships, that is one of the most important things because you in your team are in different kind of micro team, I would say, every day. You switch team. Am I correct? So, and also, culture and values is outside of this culture. It might be so that we speak about the culture of um, uh, how the feedback culture is. And there are loads of feedback wherever we are. And the feedback, is the feedback always good feedback? What do you say? Sorry? It, it is interesting because Abraham Klug may get, made a study that only one third of feedback is actually developing yourself. One third is you're staying in the same level and one third is negative. So it's really interesting to see if we're in a blame culture or the importance to actually know how we feedback each other also. So values, culture, commitment is outside and relations is one of the most important topics. Another model that we have used a lot within the police is this one where we have me or the individuals in one circle, the next team, and the third, the task or mission. Me, my commitment, my understanding of my capacity, my understanding of my core qualities. That means your understanding of your capacity, your energy level, your work-life balance, as Sonia mentioned, the way of setting boundaries, but also the way of sharing, contributing. Emotions are contagious. If I'm smiling and glad and happy when I enter work, I will mostly, I guess, give someone else a smile. If I enter really slowly lacking, or if I would be standing out back of this side, I don't think you would like this talk that much, or what do you say? So, we have a, a, the power to use ourselves in the best way. That's our choice. Team. We spoke about feedback. How can we work in the best way? How do we contribute to this team in the best way? What are the most important things in your team? Collaboration. Having fun. Enjoying work and develop. And a culture where it's possible for you to relax. and to develop. So we say that in the center, that's where we should be to have an environment where employees feel good, the organization is developing, and that you also increase efficiency and relaxed efficiency. We have used a model to check the current state and level of ambition. And this could be interesting maybe for one of, or two of you to see where are your, your own organization? How much are you working with proactive, reactive, or is it really lacking? So the D level in the organization might be lack of work commitment in the areas of interpersonal, of mental health, of taking care of caregivers. C is reactive efforts. That's when we have a conflict or some other kind of situation, friction, 
or a Christ, you choose to contact someone like me. When you have debriefing after situations, instead of having it continu continuously. B, continuously efforts with both proactive and reactive measures of high quality. That's when you have a plan. A plan to work with all the co-workers. A plan to give everyone opportunity to grow, to understand their own potential, and their own, own res responsibility to actually be a part of the team, to actually choose to be a part of the team. Because that is our responsibility, that is our choice. And that is what's so brilliant about things, that we actually can choose every day what kind of intention we set into our day, what kind of intention we choose to have together with our co-workers and how we want to meet every person we meet. That is our choice. So, we do this through measuring work environment, uh, managing culture, engagement and collaborations. We also check different kind of leadership uh, programs, if there are leadership programs or co-worker programs. And if you have like coaching on individual level or reflection. And if you have different kind of workshops to giving the employees the understanding. Because it isn't always easy to know how to do this. You have different kind of workshops within your area, within medicine, but maybe not that much about how to bridge the interpersonal relationship. How you should give feedback or feed forward in the best way. Or how to use yourself in the best way. As Sonia mentioned, work-life balance. <clears throat> I use the word work-life harmony, same, same. To care for oneself, to care for caregivers, is, <clears throat> excuse me, to understand how to take care of yourself, where your limits are at, how you can support your colleagues to be the best version. How do you do that? How do the managing team support the co-workers in the best way. How easy is it to speak about our challenges and needs? And are we actually aware about them? Or do we block them? Well, that is a choice that we all have the capacity to make. To block or to share or to understand more about. During, my start at, during the pandemic, there were several saying, well, Natalia, we don't need you here. It's nice that you're here. It's nice chatting with you, but we're not sure we really need it. It took a while. One by one, I had beautiful talks and there were beautiful insights about work-life harmony about setting your attention, making your choice, and how to empower yourself in the best way, and how to empower each other in the best way, because that's your choice. We have the choice, the ability to make that every day. So, why did we do the check-in in the beginning? The check-in is one tool to give you the opportunity to learn about where your colleagues are in that moment. What's the stress level? What's actually going on? 
Because if you just take a moment before we end this, I would like to ask, just scroll back in your memory in which team you felt the best, in which team you felt free, had the possibility to be your authentic you, to use all of you. What was the quality in that team? And then aim for that every day as much as possible, because that's your choice. That's your possibility to make it happen. From my point of view, you all are, are all experts on yourself. So I can just give you options, possibilities, but it's your choice and your responsibility to, to see how you choose to be in the best way that you wish it. So the check-in is a tool for you to work together in every day to check where you are at. So I wish you all lovely days here to explore, to learn more and to widen the bridges between you, not only bridging the mind, but also the interpersonal relationship. So thank you. Thank you very much um, for a fascinating presentation, one I truly wasn't expecting. That was brilliant. Um, any, do we have any questions or comments um, from the floor? Just, oh, please. For the others, very quickly, uh, you can use your app to send questions hmm, if you don't feel comfortable to ask a question uh, on the mic, you can send us a question via the app uh, on your microphone, uh, on your oh, cell phone. <laughs> it was a very nice uh, session. It was much more than I, I expected. And uh, I always pay attention to the uh, uh, physical and uh, mental wellness. So the uh, um, as a leader, so it is very important to be uh, fair to everyone. But uh, I just have a one comment. I'm from uh, Houston, and uh, so we always remind people of diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion. DEI. Maybe it's a, the, uh, I'm in the United States. That may be the reason it's not uh, Sweden. So it's uh, me being uh, uh, Japanese, living in Houston for 21 years, I have never felt uncomfortable because Houston is a very cultural diverse city. But uh, I don't think it is everywhere in the United States. So how do you think about uh, DEI uh, from other European countries? Um, Just may I connect to, you, to may connect to your question? I'm from Jerusalem. <laughs> about Should the diversity. Yeah. Hi, could we ask the faculty to come back up, please? We've got your microphone, and then we can ask, answer the questions. Yeah. Come up, Sonia. Yeah. Henrik? The question was really about one about diversity and, and how we can manage that within our workforce when we're thinking about these sorts of issues. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I think you need to build a common culture within your unit. Um, there are, we are, it's not like the US and Sweden, but almost in Stockholm in a way. So there's a lot of different uh, people coming from all around the, the globe. Um, and I think what, we, what you need to build is sort of a common, common ground to stand on at your unit and share that culture with each other. Um, I, can, I think you can do that even though there is a diversity among the staff. I would also like to share that about di diversity through growing self-awareness to growing um, <clears throat> collaboration, understanding for the differences and how we can use them in the best way. That goes like through the, the di diversity in the in a best way because then we see people for their uh, ability, for the what they can contribute to the the staff and the team and so on. I do agree. I would like to point out that it's not that much diversity at the department where I work at, but in general, I think that regardless of nationality or whatever you want to make a diversity in, if we all uh, think about the most important thing, which is our patient and care of the patient and safety of the patient, regardless whether you, we are physicians, clinicians, nurses, physiotherapists, perfusionists, then we have a same goal and same thing to achieve and that uh, basically will bring down all barriers regarding any diversity and we can work together and as Natalie mentioned, we can learn from each other. It can be only mm, a contribution to our work and to ourselves in personal. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add, as I said, I'm from Jerusalem, from Adassa Medical Center. Uh, we have it very diverse, not only the patient, also the team. And uh, I want to add to what you said uh, and to celebrate the holidays together. It's very important uh, when you work in multicultural department, not only from the patient side, also from the staff side. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, my question actually is for the first speaker. Uh, you talk about 12 hours shift, yes. but you didn't mention how many hours per week your team is working? It's uh, more important than the shift hour. Uh, thank you for this comment, it's great. Uh, I have not realized until now it may differ so much. Uh, the schedule at uh, the hospital basically where I work at is uh, two to three. That means two days work, two days off, three days work, and then the following week is the other way around. So in general, it, uh, to uh, sum up uh, the number of hours you are obliged to do to fulfill the requirements is uh, usually 17, 16 to 17 shifts. But I think I can speak for all of the nurses and clinicians and physicians as well. So we you, work overtime, all of us. Have so extra you, you don't have any stricted weeks, hours. Uh, by the union, uh, by the Ministry the of Health or something, because in Israel we, have, we work 36 hours per week. It uh -huh. doesn't matter what shift, 12 or 8, okay. eight hours shift. It's strict for 36. Okay. I can tell you that we work only 36. Of course, we work <laughs> over hours, but over hours are more expensive hours. So, and it's uh, voluntarily only. That's why I ask uh, how many hours per week your uh, uh, we team is working? We don't measure it by week, it's measured by month. By month, it doesn't yes. matter. It's, so it's 156 it's hours. Usually, yeah, usually, yeah, 156, 160, one, so it's as, the same as, as the month comes, um, uh, depending on the, the amount of days. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got time for one very quick question, John. Oh, uh, I had two lengthy questions, I'm sorry. Uh, Maybe the first one would be there's a dis um, I like to talk about leadership. Uh, there's quite a lot in the, the English newspapers at the moment that talk about the civil service promotes leaders or promotes leadership skills and some, quite often that means that they leave the work behind. So how do you get someone to be a leader whilst they're still doing the work they're meant to do? 
Sorry, what did you say the last words? How do, do you become... How do you get someone to be a leader without leaving behind, you know, I suppose I'm reflecting on being promoted to a job to lead the unit. Sometimes people believe that the, the job they used to do, they've left that behind. They're now leaders. How do you get them to integrate those two levels, the leadership plus continuing to do the work? I think that's... I think that's um, it's a hard one, um, especially if you go from the from the ward and then you go up in a leadership role, then it's even harder because then you have the knowledge on how you usually work. Uh, for myself, I'm coming from outside into a new ward and it's easier to take the leading or the managing role. Uh, but I also think it's very positive to have the ability and the knowledge on how things works uh, with the patient cares. Uh, but it is, it is a it's a thin line to walk because uh, sometimes you, sh you don't have enough hours during the day to, to both be the manager and also work on the floor. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and I would say to like really be clear for yourself where to set your uh, energy and how much. And also, <clears throat> like we have been working um, with the ECMO department in Stockholm, we have worked closely with the manager group to also set uh, intentions and goals every month to be really clear of where they are headed. And through that work, also seeing where to contribute and add in the everyday also. So it's been like collaborating between those two parts. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much. Um, there was the other thing about the military tool you use, but maybe I'll catch you about that in the break. No problem. Lovely. Well, thank you. Thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers for a wonderful, very eye-opening and very different session from what I thought we would have. So thank you all. Thank you.